Good afternoon to everybody. We thank God and praise God for your presence in Bible study on today. We thank you for being on our conference line and our Facebook page as well as our website to, to view this Bible study on today. We ask and pray that if you are watching on Facebook that you please hit the share button so that you can share this with your family and friends. Well, today we're going to continue <clears throat> our conversation from Psalm 139 and we introduced the psalm on yesterday, I'm sorry, on last week and we also I uh, looked at verses 1 through 12. Today we're going to finish the psalm, verses 13 through 24. So if you would please turn into your Bibles, whether it be in book form, cell phone, laptop, desktop, or even tablet. Psalm 139, beginning at verse 13. And it reads this way. For you created my innermost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I, to, were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, <clears throat> I am still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O God, away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Thus ending the reading of God's word. <clears throat> Let us pray. Father, we do thank you and we do praise you for this opportunity to come to study your word on today. For your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask and pray that you would bless those who are watching, watching and listening on today. And we pray that you would be the ultimate teacher. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Verse 23 of Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And therefore, we are entitling um, this lesson from verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Let me just go back to the introduction that we gave on last week and uh, give an overview of verses 1 through 12 and then uh, we can dig into the verses that are left for us today. As I said on last week, there was not much contextualization with this um, text, Psalm 139. However, even though we are not doing much contextualization, you can apply this psalm to your life because all through it we can see the sovereignty of God. As we have said so many times before from the book of Psalms, this whole notion of sovereignty is very important. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, we are talking about God being creator, God being in control, God reigning. God being creator. And within the sovereignty of God, there were two aspects that came about on last week, and that was the omniscience of God 
which basically means that God knows all things. And then we also talked about this whole notion of the omnipresence of God, God being everywhere in which the psalmist alludes to throughout Psalm 139. So Psalm 139 has been uh, communicated as good news to all people in all times. It is still thousands and thousands of years later to us good news even in times that we are living in today. It expresses the assurance that God is present and that God knows all about us for the Israelites as they were leaving exile or had left exile. Uh, but the common assurance for us on today, knowing that God is present, that God knows all about us, that God knows all things, even in the midst of this COVID-19 and this pandemic and all that surrounds it, that is, that is good news. Scholars believe that the verses for today provide the origin of the psalm. We see that, that the psalmist uh, may have been accused of something, or he may have been overcome by his enemies, and, and therefore he makes an appeal in the latter part of these verses, and he basically affirms or wants to affirm his innocence. He asks God for uh, not only to declare him innocent, but he asks God to be vengeful against his enemies, which he believes is God's enemies or are God's enemies. And so that is probably um, the origin of the psalm. So the psalm has numerous times uh, the word known, and we we saw it in verses 1 and 2, verses 4 and 6. We also see it in our text for today, uh, verse 14, where it says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And then we see it again in verse 23, this word know or known or knowledge. Uh, we see it, search me, O God, verse 23. 23, and know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. So the word know, known, or knowledge occurs seven times, and that basically uh, for us means completeness or fullness. It reiterates the fact that the psalmist was known fully and completely by God. And we see this message of God fully knowing the psalmist from verse 1 to verse 18, and this whole knowledge of God knowing the psalmist is also the foundation for some petitions and affirmations that are included in verse 19 through 24. So the psalmist makes it very clear that he is known by God. And since he is known by God, he belongs to God. And so we'll talk about that more in a few moments. Let me just reiterate the structure of the psalm. In verses 1 through 6, we have God's knowledge of the psalmist's actions through words and deeds. And then in verses 7 through 12, we have a question in verse 7 and then a response affirming God's knowledge of the psalmist. And then today we will look at verses 13 through 18 which talk about God's intimate knowledge of the psalmist, um, knowledge of the psalmist to God's creative activity. In fact, the psalmist knows that God knows all things, and we see God knowing all things through God's creation and how God created things, God's activity in creation. And then, Finally, verses 19 through 24, there is this contrast between the loyalty of God and the rebellious behavior of the enemies of God and the psalmist. So the enemies of God are also the enemies of the psalmist. So 
Let's quickly look at verses 1 through 12. Um, in verses 1 through 6, we have these statements about uh, the omniscience of God. God has searched the psalmist and God knows uh, the psalmist. And this is what matters most to the psalmist. What matters most to the psalmist is that God knows him. And so the psalmist desires to be and is fully known by God. And God makes it very clear to the psalmist that God knows him fully and completely. God knows the psalmist's deeds. In verse 2, you know when I sit down and when I rise. In verse 3, you discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. And then in verse 24, we see... The psalm is saying, see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of understanding. So God knows completely and fully the psalmist's deeds. God knows completely and fully the psalmist's thoughts. Verse 2b, you perceive my thoughts from afar. And God knows completely the psalmist's words before they are even spoken. Verse 4, before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. O oh Lord. The psalmist is not intimidated by this knowledge. He says that this knowledge is actually wonderful. In verse 5, he said, You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. This might be perceived as threatening when someone hems you in from behind and in front and laid their hands on you. But it is much different when it comes to God. This whole word him in verse 5 means to protect. And so what God does, because God knows the psalmist and because God knows everything about the psalmist, God protects the psalmist. And so the psalmist basically celebrates the good news, uh, the marvelous and mysterious reality uh, that his life is accessible to God in every way and at every moment. God knows all about him. And the psalmist believes that this is good and this is marvelous, but it is also very mysterious to him. And then in verses 7 through 12, we have language that we have heard so many times. Verse 7, where, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. And, and so we see this whole notion of of the spirit, where can I go from your spirit? Uh, the spirit, the wind, the breath of God, it, it basically proclaims the presence of God. God is omnipresent or God is everywhere. Literally, um, God is in our face or God's face is always among us. And what the psalmist is trying to stress here is the fact that God is omnipresent, that God is everywhere, that you cannot ex escape the presence of God. And, and so he says, even if you try to flee from God, you cannot do so. And so the psalmist sees God's inescapable presence as good news. And he even used this uh, mystical notion where he says, in verse 9, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even though your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. He uses a mystical um, or mystical knowledge to basically say um, that God is even there in extreme places, in the wild places of our imagination. God is even there. He says, God is everywhere to lead us and to hold on to us. Even in hell, God is there. God is not only in heaven. God is not only here on earth. God is even in hell. And the psalmist basically says that hell is not even beyond the reach of God. God, because God is present, God will guide and God will hold fast. Then, in verses 11 through 12, he talks about this whole notion of darkness. But he also says in verses 11 through 12 that this darkness is dispelled by God's light. Uh, 
God's light always prevails. This whole notion of light is associated with God's presence, God's face, God's countenance. God is light, and because God is light, God is always present, and God knows all about us. So we see this poetic beauty and brilliance of God's presence and God knowledge and of God's knowledge all throughout the first 12 verses of Psalm 139. So now let's, let's continue this whole notion of God knowing everything and God being everywhere in verses 13 through 18. And let me read it again. I know I read it before, but let me read it again. For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Verse 13 begins with this emphatic Hebrew pronoun, you. For you created my innermost being. Again, it talks about God being creator. As God being sovereign, God is also creator. And God is, as creator means that God was active in the world. For you created my innermost being. God's activity in creation is emphasized. God created my innermost being. And so there is this eloquent view, and we see it in verses 13, 14, 15, and 16, this eloquent biblical view that human life is not simply a natural biological occurrence, but human life is the result of the will and the work of a good God, a benevolent God. God formed us, verse 13, for you created my innermost being. God formed us. And it talks about the gracious activity towards God's people. When God formed us, even in our mother's womb, God was being gracious to us. God formed us. And notice, notice this whole notion of the power of God. God is not only omniscient. God is not only omnipresent. God is also omnipotent. God is all-powerful. God created us. Created our innermost being, verse 13. And look, you knit me together in my mother's womb. When we entered into our mother's womb, God was weaving us together. I know that other books talk about us being the clay, that God is part of takes the form, but in this particular imagery, God weaves us, God knitted us together. God was gracious enough to do that. And so God's creation of Israel, of us, is proclaimed as one of God's wonderful works. Verse 14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So God formed us and made us as God wanted us to be. When God created us, we did not have any, any, any defect. God created us exactly as God wanted us to be. And we may not be as tall as some. Uh, we may not uh, be as slim as some. Uh, we may not be as heavy as some or short as some. 
But God made us exactly as God wanted us to be. God knitted us together. And what God did is that God oversaw this whole process of creating us. Uh, God oversaw it. The psalmist says in verse 15, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. So God is the overseer of the process. God is the architect of the process. God is the one who basically made us. And we need to thank God because each and every one of us, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. When we look at ourselves in the mirror or when we look at anyone else in creation, uh, we should declare that the works of God are wonderful. Everything that God created, God created as good. And we need to have that same type of knowledge uh, that the psalmist has, the fact that the works of God are wonderful, and he knows that for himself. It is interesting that the psalmist says that God knows all about him. And since God knows all about him, he begins to know about God. The reality is, however, that we will not know all there is to know about God because our minds are finite. We will only know a minute of what it is to know about God. But God knows all about us fully and completely. All of God's creation, God knows all about and God is protecting all of us at the same time. This whole notion in verse 15 when he says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. And that secret place is, is the womb of our mothers when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Uh, the depths of the earth, this whole notion of this secret place refers to the womb or uh, our mother's womb. And so... God knew all about it, how we were being framed and how we were being woven together uh, because God was in charge. God was in control of the process. Your eyes saw my uninformed, unformed body. Uh, God is the one who has intricately woven us together. So in verse 15, he says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. And then that refers back to verse 13, where the psalmist says, for you created my innermost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. It does not answer when life begins. And we know that that is such an important question in reference to our country today and this whole notion of Roe versus Wade and abortion rights or a woman's right to choose. Um, but it does answer who made us and how we were made. We were made by God and God wove us together. And we are beautifully and wonderfully made. In verses 13 through verse 15 through 16a are congruent with this because we see in verse 13 again, for you created my innermost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And then we see verse 14 where it says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And we see this congruence again in verse 15 through 16a where it says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You, your eyes saw my uninformed body. And so God is so powerful that God created us even while we were in our mother's womb. And this is another statement that God knows the psalmist. 
and that each human being belongs to God in every aspect. In the past, we belong to God. When God was creating us and knitting us together, when God was framing us, it lets us know that we belong to God. God basically knew us in the past. We belong to God in the past, and then we belong to God in the future. This whole notion of we have been preordained. Verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed body, and then this, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to me. So, because God knows all things, because God is everywhere, God, even before the beginning of the time, ordained our days and symbolically wrote them in his book. God ordained that I would be here even before I came into being. God ordained this day that I would be preaching Psalm 139 or teaching Psalm 139. Again, it, it speaks of the omnipresence of God, the omniscience of God, and God being omnipotent. God being all-powerful, God knowing all things, and God being everywhere. So we belong to God in every aspect, the past, the future, and the present, where it says, in verse 23 through 24, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So we belong to God in every aspect, the past, the future, and the present. Even though God can comprehend our thoughts, we cannot comprehend the thoughts of God. Again, God is omniscient. God knows all things. We only know a few things. We do not know even a little bit of what God knows. God knows our thoughts in verse 2. It says, you know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. And then we see in verse 17 this whole notion of us not being able to begin to comprehend the thoughts of God. Verse 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. So the psalmist thinks of the thoughts of God as precious, but he also thinks of them as incomprehensible, inconceivable, insurmountable. There are so many that he cannot even grasp the sum of the thoughts of God. God knows our thoughts, but we do not know even a minuscule of what is to be known about God. And therefore, we need to stop trying to be God and to think for God. We need to let God be God because God is all powerful. And then he says in verse 18, he says, Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the same. That's how vast the thoughts of God are. We could not even count all the grains of sand on this earth. And even if we began to estimate what that number is, the thoughts of God would outnumber those grains of sand. It makes sense. God is created. God created the grains of sand. Did God not? Yes, God did. And so, of course, because of God's sovereignty, God is going to be able to out, God's thoughts are going to be, out, be able to outnumber the grains of the sand. So in verse 18b, we see this word awake. When I awake, I am still with you. Um, scholars believe that when we look at the word awake, that the psalmist spent the night in the temple as protection for his accusers or 
um, praying to God and waiting for an answer. It's possible, but we really do not know. And it really may not be important because what the psalmist realizes in verse 18 is what we have talked, bef talked about before. He realizes the omnipresence of God. He realizes that God is always present. He realizes that he is always with God. When I awake, I'm still with you. When he laid down, he was with God. When he woke up, he was with God. And I know that there are times in our lives in which it feels as if God is not present. As if God does not know about what we're going through. As if God cannot fix the situation, but... We need to have the calm assurance that God knows all things, that God is all-powerful, and God is always, God is always present. God is always with us. So when we look at verse 18, uh, were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand when I was awake, I am still with you. Basically, they recall verses one. Uh, verses rather 7 through 12. Verse 18 does when it talks about God being creator. And when it talks about God being creator, he, he thinks about the thoughts of God and, and talk about how um, vast they are and how numerous they are. And if he were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When you look at verse 17, where he says, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. It recalls verses 1 through 6, which again talk about God knowing all things. First to God searching us and knowing us. So the psalmist comes to the conclusion that his origin lies with God. God created him. His beginning lies with God. His past lies with God. His present lies with God. And his future, his destiny lies with God. His origin and his destiny lie with God. So again in verses 1 through 18, he's talking about God knowing him. Again, God is... Everywhere, God is all-powerful. God knows all things. Verses 19 through 24, they all constitute the culmination of the psalm. The psalmist in verse 14 responds with thanks to God's creative activity. Verse 14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So the psalmist responds with thanks to God's creative activity. He praises God or gives God thanks for what God has done in relationship to creating him. When we look at verses 19 through 22, um, his response seems to be different. Some scholars say that verses 19 through 22 are not a part of the original psalm. They do not belong to the psalm. In fact, during liturgical settings, during the liturgical year when Psalm 139 is the Old Testament scripture for the particular week, it does not include verses 19 through 22. It goes from verses 1 through 18 uh, to verses 23 uh, and 24. Um, but some scholars believe that these verses do not belong to the rest of the psalm. And, and that is because there is this request for revenge. Let me read it, verses 19 through 22. If only you would slay the wicked, O God, away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. And so we have the psalmist asking for God to give revenge. Asking for God 
to set things in order. And he makes it very clear he hates those who hates God. He abhors or hates those who rise up against God. And so he says, I count them as enemies, those who are opposed to God. Now remember, uh, we said that there is in these verses 19 through 24, this contrast between a gracious God and the enemies of God and the psalmist. So the point I want to make here is that the psalmist sees the enemies of God as his enemies also. So um, there is this, this request for revenge. And so, you know, we know that the Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, but um, these verses really convey how things really are. Verses 1 through 18 says we belong to God. And verses 23 and 24 state we really try to live as God intends. But when we look at verses 19 through 22, it says that we will always be opposed by those who oppose God. Those who are God's enemies will also be our enemies. So let's look at verses 19 through 22. Again, there is this request for revenge. But the real request is not that God will basically destroy the enemies or hurt the enemies or bring the enemies to the recognition that they have done wrong. But the real request is that God set things in order in God's created, created world. So the psalmist is asking God to set things in order. He sees things as being out of order. And he realizes that it is God's world. And therefore, he asks God to set things right in God's own world. In other words, he, he is asking God to make sure that God's will be done. Yes, there are requests for revenge, but notice that the psalmist does not take these matters into his own hands. What the psalmist does is that he makes this request um, to God, and he leaves the request with God. He entrusts his request to God. He does not take matters into his own hands, as we sometimes do. He tells God what he would like to see done, what he would like to see God do. He makes a petition to God, but he does not take matters into his own hands. He leaves that to God. What a word. Leave it to God. Let God fight your battles. Don't take matters into your own hands because you're going to make them a whole lot worse than they would have been if you had of given it to God. So, another thing, when the psalmist talks about this whole notion of hatred, verse 21, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? Verse 22, I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Uh, this hatred expressed is simply a matter of personal feeling. That's all it is. The psalmist is just expressing his personal opinion. It's not that he's going to go out and do anything hateful to those who hate God. But this is his way of saying that he opposes those who oppose God. And he is on God's side and not on the opposition side. So he says he opposes those who opposes God and that he is on the Lord's side, which is the right side. So the psalmist is on the Lord's side. And this makes sense, doesn't it? God knows all about him. God sees 
all about it. God protects him. God knows where he goes. And while he goes there, God protects him. God has shown God's power by forming him the way God wanted him to be. And therefore, because God is everywhere, all-powerful, all-present, where else is his loyalty going to be? His loyalty is going to be where it should be. It should be with a sovereign God. Our loyalty, our trust should be in the one who created us and the one who protects us and the one whose presence is with us now. So the psalmist's loyalty to God is sealed by verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The psalmist lays himself open to God's examination. He says, search me, O Lord, and know me. And he realizes in verse 3 that he has continually been searched by God. And he realizes from verses 1 and 2 that God knows him and God has seen him. Verses 1, 2, 4, and 16. And he has experienced the leading of God, verse 10. And the psalmist states that he wants to be led by God. Verse 23, search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. He wants God to search him, to know his heart, to test him and know his anxious thoughts and to see if there is any offensive way in him. Why he wants God to do this self-examination so that God can lead him in a way where he will have everlasting life. In a way in which he will be able to know God forever. He wants to be led by God. The psalmist trusts his life to God. Now, verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. He trusts his life to God now and forever and lead me in the way everlasting. So he is secure in his conviction that he has been, is being, and will be fully known by God. Think about the scriptures we come to uh, the New Testament where it says we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. Uh, we have been, we are known by God and we will fully be known by God does not yet appear what we shall be, but in the twinkling of an eye, we shall appear as he is. So we want to be known by God and we want God to search us and we want God to lead us in a way that God will know us in the future, which is eternal life. This whole notion of God being with us is seen in, for example, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Um, and, and let's turn there, Matthew chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 23. When Jesus was, was born, it says, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so... Uh, Christ is with us, but Christ is with us through the Holy Spirit. He left the Holy Spirit with us to be our comforter and to be in our midst. And even Jesus um, says in Matthew 28, And surely I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. 
So Christ's presence is always, is always with us. Uh, we see also God being all-powerful through the miracles that he performed through Jesus, but ultimately in raising Jesus after he had been dead for three years. We see God's power and that power, that resurrection power is still available to us on today. So that is Psalm 139. And we're moving on. Um, we are next week looking at Psalm 140, uh, which is um, a psalm said to be a psalm of David. We will dig into this and we have 11 psalms left and then we will be finished with the book of Psalms. So next week, um, Psalm 140. Let me remind you of our series that we are having entitled Senior Chats. Uh, Senior Chats. And so we want you to please, uh, please be a part of that, not only if you are a senior of our church, but um, all persons can join, but we are basically emphasizing this for our seniors every Saturday in October at 12 noon. Elder Natatu North will be our facilitator. She is a therapist, a trained therapist. So um, she will be talking to us from certain topics and they will be centered for our seniors of our church and we ask that you please be um, involved and be a participant. Again, it's not only for our seniors, but it is for all of us through our website and our Facebook page. And then on October the 14th will be our third installment of our September-October series, Neighbors Together in Faith and Justice in which the Lutheran Church of the Reformation, Hill Havara and Mount Moriah are coming together over the course of four evenings to discuss our own traditions, histories, and texts of racism and anti-Semitism, as well as elements of our own traditions from a historical and theological point that call for anti-racism and racial inclusion. And you have heard Rabbi Hannah's voice uh, all during the month of October that announces this. So please be a part of this Neighbors Together in Faith and Justice next session, October the 14th and every Saturday during the month of October, Senior Chats with our seniors at 12 noon on Saturdays. Um, God bless you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to come to study Psalm 139, and we praise you for being our protector, for forming us, for creating us, and we thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to be our comforter and our guide. Lead us and direct us in the path of righteousness to a way that is everlasting. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen.